Hello folks and welcome back. This is the first of what I think is going to be a two-part series introducing my next major project. If you've been with me for a while you might recall oh, about two months or so ago now I uh, posted a video entitled New Project Thoughts in a little bit of nature. I think it's video number 269. If you see this little pop-up over my uh, shoulder here, if you click on that, that will take you to that video if you'd like to go back and look at that if you haven't seen it already. The little video clip or audio clip that you just heard was from that project and I clipped that out of the, the first part of the next piece of this video that you're going to see here in a moment. But first I want to do a little bit of an introduction here before we get to the bike itself. Uh, this project uh, was very fortuitous for me in terms of timing. Uh, right after I shot that last video, that is the uh, new or next project thoughts, one evening I was surfing uh, the net and I thought I'd check Craigslist. Now I never check Craigslist. I haven't I've really gone on Craigslist and looked for uh, any, any items in it's been years. Uh, I don't shop actively for motorcycles. I've got plenty of projects as it is, but based on that previous video I had something in mind so I just plugged in uh, a search a term into Craigslist and this project popped right up. It was located uh, geographically very close to me, about 60 miles away, and this was on a Sunday evening, so I thought, well, I'm not going to call the person on a Sunday night. Uh, he indicated in his posting that uh, he wanted phone calls only, no texts, no emails, direct communication only, so I waited until the next morning, and that had been Monday, of course, called him first thing he picked up. And he still had it for sale, and he indicated I was the only person that had uh, called him on it. He'd had it on Craigslist apparently for, well, at least probably a month or so, if not maybe even six or eight weeks. And he was becoming discouraged. He didn't think anyone was really interested in the motorcycle until I called. And it was kind of a rainy morning that day, and I didn't have a lot planned in the shop, so I said, can I come over right now? He was a retired gentleman. I ran right over there that morning. I was standing in his garage probably within an hour and a half to two hours, and there the project was. He hadn't owned the project very long. He picked it up, I think he said, uh, earlier in the spring. This is uh, late summer 2021. I think he said he picked it up that spring with the uh, sole intent of flipping it. It was an estate auction or a yard sale or something along those lines. It was in non-running condition when he bought it. And I'll go into that in a little more detail here in a few minutes. So he brought it home, uh, did some work to it, and put it on Craigslist, Craigslist, and I found it, and it followed me home. And I haven't really done anything to it at all uh, outside of I brought it into the shop, uh, looked it over a little bit. Well, again, we're going to go through some of that in more detail here in a moment. But uh, I did want to give you a little setup as to how I found the motorcycle. It was very fortuitous. Again, it, it just worked out for me. It was the exact project I was looking for. And this will be, I think, my next restoration project. So let's go outside and take a look at the bike. I'll start it and, again, run it. You'll, you'll hear the same sound that you heard as a, as a lead into this segment and we'll talk through um, the bike as it currently exists. In part two of this series, I believe I'll get into a little bit more of my plans and what I'm going to do next uh, as we prepare to restore this. <laughs> Well, there it is, folks, a 1973 Suzuki TS-50, a.k.a. the Gaucho. It's virtually all original except for some wear items, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is the condition it was in when I picked it up from the previous owner. I've done nothing to it outside of start it and look it over. I really haven't done anything else. I'll go through here briefly with you uh, a list of some of the things that the previous owners that I bought it from did to the bike before he, he flipped it to me. Uh, he installed new handle grips, installed a new battery under the seat. We'll take a look at that in a minute. He lined the fuel tank with a fuel tank liner. We're going to talk about that in more detail also. Uh, new piston and rings, gaskets uh, for the engine. The engine side covers on both sides, so you can see the one on the left right here, as well as the side cover on the opposite side. He did install a new chain. 
that chain he installed by his own admission he made a mistake that's a inexpensive Asian import and I don't think the pitch is just right neither does he, did he because it catches even though the, the rear sprocket and the front sprocket seem to be in reasonably good condition that chain wants to catch so I think the uh, spacing between the links isn't quite right so that'll be replaced eventually he painted the taillight housing over here in silver and he had to source a, a new ignition key because it didn't have an ignition key when he got it uh, let's go around to the other side and I want to talk about a couple of things. I mentioned a moment ago that he installed a new boot between the air cleaner housing and the engine case. That's nothing but a piece of radiator hose. He said he couldn't locate uh, the correct uh, boot. It did come with a boot, the original boot, which has um, become very hard and brittle, which is very common. And he has shrunk a bit and it, it doesn't fit anymore in the joint there between those two components. And he said he looked around a little bit, tried to find a new boot, and was unable to do so. And that's where he improvised that uh, radiator hose. And I give him credit for coming up with a solution. It is workable, but for my one of my projects, that is not going to stay in place long term. I mentioned the engine cover right here uh, that he put in place. It was missing both the engine side covers, uh, left and right side. When I got the bike, or when I first picked it up, he told me that he couldn't get it to run. He put a new fuel line on, as you can see, I think here, a little fuel inline fuel filter, and he said he couldn't get it to run. And uh, I said, okay, well, I bought it anyway. I brought it home, and I looked in the fuel tank, and it did have fuel in it, but didn't have a lot. So I tilted it up vertically and sat on it. I turned the petcock on to reserve, and then I noticed fuel was flowing to the carburetor. And up to that point, there was no fuel in that fuel line. So then I um, went to start it, and lo and behold, it started on like the third or fourth kick. So I think what happened, he didn't have enough fuel in it uh, to run the petcock on just the open position, so fuel was not siphoning in or draining into the carburetor float bowl. If he turned it to reserve and stood the bike up vertically, I think he'd been fine. I did put a little bit more gas in it, fuel in it, just to avoid that. But it does run, as you see, and that, it was as simple as just turning the petcock to reserve. Uh, the engine, when he picked it up or when he bought it, uh, the cylinder and head were there, but the piston was missing. It was a part. And a real interesting story about that 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 piston and uh, the work that he did on that. He said it had been bored uh, on second oversize. You can only get two oversize uh, pistons for this bike, 0.25 millimeter and 0.5 millimeter, I believe, if I remember right. It was already on the first rebore, so he had to go the, to the second the piston was missing. And I think what happened he took the. He found someone to rebore uh, the cylinder, but I think he had it bored without having the piston in hand. And the reason I say that, there's two reasons. One is he tipped me off because he said after I got the cylinder back and a and I found a piston. He said he went to put the fit the piston into the bore to see how it fit, and he noticed it was sloppy. So that suggests to me that he had the cylinder bored. To a specification which you can look up without having the piston. Fr frankly, I'm surprised the machine shop would do that. I have never heard of boring, particularly a two stroke, without having the piston in a hand to match it to. But I do think that's what he did because that's what he implied. And the other thing I noticed, and I'll run it again for you in a second, you'll hear a terrible piston slap. You can hear it just rattling something fierce in there. I did pull the head off and I checked the piston. It is new and it is installed correctly with the arrow towards the exhaust. So he did install it correctly. So it is new, but uh, I really think it's got a really bad case of piston slap. And let me run it for you here and you, again and you can uh, listen to it carefully. <laughs> I 
don't know if you can hear that piston slap or rattle, uh, particularly on a deacceleration just before it gets back to idle. It's got a terrible rattle to it. So again, um, I really think that he bored that cylinder into a factory spec without fitting it to the piston. And now we got piston slap. So I've got a plan to fix that and we'll talk about that I think in part two. The fuel tank, let's move in here a little closer to the fuel tank and I'll see if I can't get you a better shot of that. I don't know how well you can see in there that white liner that he put in the fuel tank. He said he did clean it with phosphoric acid and then he lined it, but I don't think he did a very good job of cleaning it. And let me show you what I mean. I'm going to take my finger here and I'm just going to rub on the inside top of the tank. Look at that rust. So I, I think that's probably just surface rust, but when he went to uh, line the tank, he clearly, number one, I'm not sure he cleaned it well enough, and number two, he uh, didn't uh, roll that liner around well enough to coat completely the inside of the tank. So now what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to strip that liner out. Uh, you, you can do that chemically. Um, with harsh chemicals. I don't like doing it, but I don't have any choice. I'm going to strip that liner out and then I'm going to reline it uh, eventually uh, as part of my restoration process. I think you can see there um, this on a speedo speedometer it's got 2,140 almost 44 miles. I have no reason to believe that's not original. I think it is. The speedometer does work and actually it's in very good condition. Um, physically, it's not perfect, but it's, it's in very good condition for a 1973 model. Let's take a look under the seat. The underside of the seat pan it looks in very good condition. I don't think this bike was ever left outside to speak of. I think it was always stored inside. And going down, looking underneath the seat there, electrical and the battery. As I indicated previously, he put a new battery in it. But what was curious was when I got it home and got it running, started, I went to test the electrical and nothing worked, none of the electrical worked. So I, you know, started poking around with the battery and the first thing I noticed is the battery wasn't hooked up. The ground wire or the earth right there, that black wire, was disconnected. Now I don't know if that was just a mistake on the previous owner's part, probably was. Uh, plugged that back in and most of the electrical does work. Uh, the headlight works. The horn doesn't, and I think the taillight does too, if I recall. I'm not sure about the brake light. I know, I'm pretty sure the taillight works, but the brake light doesn't. So clearly the electrical system is going to need a little load. No doubt notice the piece of corrugated or cardboard underneath the engine. The reason for that is the two-stroke oil pump, which sits right behind this cover right here, uh, seems to be leaking. At least that's the general area where the, the oil leak comes from, it. And, and it is two-stroke oil. I could just tell by checking it. Uh, this bike very likely uses a Makuni brand oil pump. Uh, Kawasaki and Suzuki, at least in my experience, used, uh, I think exclusively on their two strokes, Makuni brand pumps. Yamaha, at least in the earlier years, made their own pump. They might have used Makunis later, I'm not sure about that. But I, I'd be willing to bet that's a Makuni pump behind there. And it's possible the pump itself, maybe the pump body's leaking, I don't know. I had that recently, of course, uh, a failure on the Kawasaki F11 where I had to replace a seal and an O-ring. So I've got to get in there as part of the work I'm going to be doing on this. Anyway, the foot pigs are also bent a little bit. I don't know if you can notice it on that one right there on the left side. It's, it's bent backwards like this. It's easily fixed. I can put that in my press and straighten it at a later time. But the bike is generally complete. I'm quite pleased with that. The front fender does have a few uh, stress cracks in them in it. Uh, not surprising. I'll have to weld that up and fix it. The you know the handle uh, bar lever right there, the clutch lever, uh, is bent. Not a problem. You can get those new still from Suzuki. There is something wrong with the clutch, and while the bike does run as I indicated and is drivable, um, it's, it's this clutch isn't quite right. One other interesting feature of this bike, it's got a five-speed transmission, which I find novel. Most of these smaller bikes uh, of this era, they had four-speed transmissions. This has a traditional one-down, four-up, five-speed, which I find very appealing. Uh, 
uh, in, I have ridden it enough to shift it through all the gears up and down, so I think that's okay. My plan is not to split the cases right now. Uh, I'll take the engine apart down to the point that I would normally split it, pull the oil pump off, do whatever maintenance I have to do, get inside there. The ignition system seems okay, but I will inspect it. But I'm, I'm going to try to avoid splitting it. Not that that would be that big a deal on a little bike like this, but it starts very quickly, which suggests to me that the lower seals, engine seals, are fine. So I don't think I'm going to have to split the engine at this point. We're going to try to avoid doing that. My plan is to do a complete frame-off restoration. Now I know some folks are going to say this is a nice survivor, and it is, frankly. It's a very nice survivor. But I am, uh, you know, my thing is restorations. And this is a great place to start, especially since I don't think I have to split the cases to get inside of the transmission at this point anyway. So it's a great place to start. And one other thing I should mention here is the tires, both front and rear, are original, I think. They're 275 by 17s. And those actually are still available from several different suppliers. You can still get those tires. So obviously I'm going to redo the tires, replace the tires, new tubes, do all the chrome, the whole nine yards. In part two of this video, I'll get into a few more details, particularly around the engine and some further plans that I'm thinking about. So we'll, uh, we'll call this video a wrap at this point. Any issues, questions, thoughts, drop me a note. Otherwise, as usual, thanks for watching.